So Ukraine does have neo-Nazis, quite a few of them. And unfortunately, historically, parts of the government even backed and promoted and supported these neo-Nazi groups, specifically the Azov Battalion. And this isn't Russian propaganda or anything. This is, I mean, I think it's important to talk about because it shows how propaganda can be effective. What is the Azov Battalion? If you're like me, how I got into this was when I would watch Putin, I'd, I'd watch these talks where Putin would say, We strive for demilita demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine. What? I would think denazification of Ukraine. Ukraine, there's no Nazis in Ukraine. What is Putin talking about? And again, I'd, I'd watch another video where Putin would get on air and he'd talk about the Nazis. And neo-Nazis deploy heavy weapons, including multiple rocket launch systems. What was Putin talking about? I, I could not get an understanding of where Putin was getting this Nazi thing from in Ukraine. After all, the president of Ukraine, Zelensky, is... Jewish. But then I learned about the Azov Battalion. And the Azov Battalion, if we pull up the Wikipedia page here, has been described as a far-right militia with connections to neo-Nazi and mem neo Nazism and members wearing neo-Nazi and SS symbols. And here's a badge that they wear, which, yeah, looks a lot like neo-Nazi symbolism. With the Wehrmacht and the SS. Founding member was a leader of the neo-Nazi Social National Assembly, the SNA. And, and it gets a little bit worse because it, there's been multiple media reporting that's been done on this. Like The Guardian says that many Azov members have links with neo-Nazi groups, and even those who laughed off the idea that they are neo-Nazis did not give the most convincing denials, citing the swastika tattoos among the fighters and one who claimed to be a, quote, national socialist. According to the Daily Beast, some of the group's members are, quote, neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and avowed anti-Semites. Again, quote, numerous swastika tattoos, where they tend to go into battle with swastikas or SS insignias drawn on their helmets. The Nation, Lev Gorkin in The Nation wrote, post-Maidan Ukraine is the world's only nation to have a neo-Nazi formation in its armed forces. That, that's stunning to me when I started reading this. So what's going on here? It gets even a little bit worse, because this Azov Battalion... It started off as a militia after the 2014 revolution, the, the democratic revolution, however you want to refer to it. Some, some far-right neo-Nazi groups got together and formed militias. And then there, it seems from my reading, my understanding, they, they incorporated themselves into the government a little bit. They were stationed as kind of special operations detachments, or they were integrated as special task police forces in the interior ministry. But since 2015, the Azov Battalion, remember the Azov Battalion is essentially made up of neo-Nazis, and, and neo-Nazis pull from all around the world. There's a section here where American neo-Nazis have come to join the Azov Battalion and have been, whether they be from Argentina or the United States or, or Europe. But in 2015, the Azov Battalion was officially upgraded to a regiment, and its structures took a definite shape. A mobilization center and a training facility was established in Kiev. There is some legitimacy here offered by the Ukrainian government to this Azov Battalion. And one thing I want to add that I maybe forgot to mention in the Wikipedia of the Azov Battalion is that this Azov Battalion, this neo-Nazi-ish leaning group, it was trained by the United States. In, in, in 2015, it, the Azov Regiment would be among the first units to be trained by the United States Army troops in their Operation Fearless Guardian. So not only was this Azov Battalion, this neo-Nazi sympathizing group, Looks like it was propped up and given legitimacy within certain parts of the Ukrainian government. The United States Army troops trained this Azov Battalion. And they're, they're mainly in the Donbass eastern portion of Ukraine fighting Russian soldiers. So when Putin gets up here and just has these ridiculous press conferences and he talks about denazification there is a sliver of truth when he says that russian soldiers are fighting nazis in some cases like in mariupol in some battles russian soldiers are fighting neo-nazis if they're fighting the azov group the russian soldiers are fighting neo-nazis that's again how propaganda works is the denazification russians are fighting nazis well in specific cases that's kind of true does this offer a, a justification or a, a legitimization for an entire invasion of Ukraine? 
No, not at all. Ukraine is a sovereign nation, a much more democratic nation than than Russia. In, in fact, Putin has stated in, in other places that he does not even view Ukraine as a legitimate state. He doesn't recognize the territorial sovereignty of Ukraine. Nonetheless, I think it's important to discuss this because, again, this, this shows how he's able to use this information as propaganda domestically and internationally. And if you think, well, we're just this, with this is Wikipedia, it's been legitimate outlets as well. Back in 2014, BBC, BBC News here, did their own reporting. Here's one, here's a headline, Neo-Nazi Threat in New, New Ukraine. And if we just watch the video here, let's see what they have to say. This is, remember, this is 2014, right during the, the revolution. The flowers and the children's tributes flashes of something more sinister. Uh, Groups of armed men strut through the square with dubious iconography. <laughs> that yellow armband is a bomb. Yeah, like look at this yellow armband. This is in Kiev in 2014. German symbol used by several SS divisions during the Second World War. Far-right graffiti is appearing, daubed on the walls of the city. The people who brought down the government were overwhelmingly ordinary Ukrainians, students and doctors, workers and even families, people who simply refused to back down. But the most organized and perhaps the most effective were a small number of far-right groups. When it came to confrontations with the police, it was often the nationalists who were the Did you see that guy's shield? Let's go back there. That guy's shield had an SS on the back of it. Where was it? Yeah, like, okay, so here, look at this guy's sh shield. There, there's the SS sign on this shield. And this is BBC. This is BBC's own reporting back in 2014, which they seem to have gone quiet on. And I think this does a disservice to everyone. A group calling itself the right sector is perhaps the largest its members can be seen marching around Kiev in columns of about a dozen. Mostly they carry baseball bats. Sometimes they carry guns. We met these men posing for pictures outside the burnt out remains of what was once their headquarters. I asked them about their political beliefs. National socialist thematic. Sometimes in all right, you see that nationalist socialist idea of one nation? I'm not saying read between the lines, but I'm not saying don't be naive either. Let's keep watching. A clean nation. Not like under Hitler, though. A clean nation. Well, what does a clean nation mean? But a little bit like that, he says. But a little bit like that. Does not pass the vibe check. What about the East, I asked. What about Crimea, where many Ukrainians feel close historical ties to Russia? Begs the question, who is a Ukrainian? Police have largely disappeared from the streets of Kiev. Law and order is maintained by so-called self-defense groups. Not all hold it. Remember, Kiev is the capital. This is 2014, and you just said police are largely vacant from the capital. Uh, the capital is maintained by these militia groups. We got a late-night phone call from another group known as C-14, inviting us to meet their leader at their new base. It turned out to be the former headquarters of the Communist Party, now occupied by the far right. It's our general mission to totally ruin 
uh, chains that connect our country with the uh, imperial uh, power uh, from the past. And that being Russia? Yes, we can do Russia, not only Russia, so Soviet Union. Are you a Nazi? Uh, no, I don't think I'm a Nazi, I'm a Ukrainian nationalist. And what does that mean? The main confrontation is uh, about that some ethnic groups uh, have uh, control uh, many business structures, some economic... Some ethnic groups have many control of business structures. I'm not liking what he's saying here. Let's keep watching. Some political forces and... Uh, Which ethnic groups? Uh, uh, Russians and Jews and... <laughs> Russians and Jews. Well, maybe uh, every some uh, non -Ukrainian. Now I'm seeing a look. They have a they have a swastika carved into the hat here. Group control a huge percent of some economic or political uh, power, and uh, of course in this situation, uh, Ukrainian people have uh, some uh, tension between it and it causes uh, conflicts. Mr. Karas says his group consists of around 200 men. C-14 is affiliated with a political party called Svoboda, or Freedom, which now controls four ministries in the new government, including the Ministry of Defense. Okay, did you catch that? I mean, C-14, this, this paramilitary, far-right, not Nazi, but actually kind of Nazi group, is associated with a political party that controls four ministries in the government, and one of those ministries being the Ministry of Defense. Again, understanding this, I can see now the kernel, the kernel of information that Putin is using to prop up this denazification propaganda. Now, whether that's still true in 2022 or was in 2021, I don't know. I am not an expert in Ukraine or Russian geopolitics at all. All I can do is show you guys the reporting that was done by legitimate news organizations in 2014 and the information that's been reported on since by The Guardian or The Daily Beast and whatever is else on the internet from legitimate sources. Two of its MPs were recently photographed brandishing well-known far-right numerology. 8-8 stands for the eighth letter of the alphabet. H-H. Heil Hitler. We are so bored in So... Not a good look. And again, I want to emphasize, this was BBC. This was BBC's own reporting in 2014. Now, I've watched a lot of DW News, a lot of BBC News, a lot of American news recently during the Ukrainian, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, because that's what it is. Russia's a belligerent state. Make no mistake, that's how I feel about it. They are conveniently quiet on their own reporting about the Azov Battalion and these issues back in 2014. And I, I wanted to highlight them here because it's an inconvenient, inconvenient part of this story, a part of the story that most people don't want to talk about. I'm sure this video will get demonetized. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of terrible comments underneath. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of misinformation, a lot of disinformation. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of, of assumptions made about me. But I want to talk about it because nobody else is talking about it. And if you're like me, you, you watched Putin's speeches and you didn't understand where he was getting this stuff from. And hopefully this offers a little bit of context, not only into what Putin was talking about, what is what is and was the Azov Battalion, and how propaganda works. And lastly, if I can just conclude that I really believe in the idea that in ambiguous situations, you should assume positive intent. So all I can say is assume positive intent of this video. This video is not Russian propaganda. This video is discussing what I found to be a fascinating topic that... I could not find much information on elsewhere on YouTube or on the internet. Thank you for watching. Leave a comment or a like below if you found this video interesting. Thank you guys for watching. I'll catch you on the next one. Bye.